Good morning, my church. I am so excited as always. I am like ready to go. I'm excited to open up the word of God to you this morning. And let's just do that because I have a whole lot to say. Why don't you write down at the top of your page, do it for the kids. Come on, do it for the kids. That is the title of my message. And we are going to be reading out of 1 Chronicles 22, uh, 2 to 6. And this is David. This is David talking. And I love David. I think you all know that. He is my favorite, my most favorite human in the Bible. He's just that raw, honest guy that I relate to. And I relate to his heart here again. David says, he, he gave orders to gather the foreigners who were in the land of Israel at this time. He assigned stone cutters, all right, to hew out stones to build the house of God. David prepared. Can you say, David prepared? Okay, we're going to try that again. Say, David prepared. Good, I felt you on that one. David prepared. Super important. Large quantities of iron to make nails for the doors of the gates and for the clamps, the trusses, and more bronze that could even be weighed. He prepared a whole lot of stuff, didn't he? Cedar trees beyond number for the Sidonians and Tyrians. He brought large quantities of cedar timber uh, to David. These are all the things that the people that he put in charge of making preparations, this is all the stuff they brought to David. David said this, Solomon, my son is young and he's inexperienced and the house that is to be built for the Lord shall be exceedingly magnificent, famous, and an object of glory and splendor. Wow. The, I mean, these words describing the house of God, they're incredible, full of glory and splendor throughout all the lands of the earth all the lands of the earth. This place is going to just be wow. So now, David says, so now, in my time and in my generation, I will make preparations for it. Therefore, David made ample preparations before his death. Again, David, he made preparations. Why don't we pray together here this morning? Holy Spirit, Thank you so much that you're here. Thank you for the worship. Thank you for all of the moments where you've already been speaking to us, where you have been doing a work in our hearts. And as we gather around your word, as we lean right in into this moment, Thank you that you have prepared food for us to eat. You have prepared something for every single person who's leaning in and listening this morning. There is something you want to say. There is wisdom you want to impart. There is direction and there is hope and there is something that is within this word for us. And so speak to us, Holy Spirit. Use your word to change us, to transform us, and to uh, create in us your image, God. Would you continue to transform us and do the work within our lives? We need your help. We need your help. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Amen. Well, a lot of you have heard this story, but I never tire of telling it. What a significant moment this was for me personally. It was the first day of school, September, just a couple years ago, we sent off our son Judah and Abby on the bus. They went off to school and now it's the end of the day and I'm so excited. I'm that mom with her phone, you know, at the side of the road as the bus is coming down. I walk across the road to see my son coming off the bus. Hey Judah, it's so good to see you, buddy. How is your day? And what do I see on him but flushed cheeks, and a look of fear and terror in his eyes. And I, I asked him, I'm like, Jude, what's wrong? Are you okay? And he said, Mom, something bad happened. And I'm thinking, okay, what? What happened? He goes, Abby's lost. And I kind of overlooked it and was like, okay, what? I look at the bus driver and I said, I'm sorry, what? Abby's lost. And she goes, no, 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 it's fine. It's fine. Her dad came to pick her up off of the bus at the school, he's probably on his way home right now with Abby. Little did the bus driver know, but I had just left Caleb 
at the office in the middle of the city, it would be impossible for him to have picked up Abby off of the bus before I'm meeting them at home. So I look at her and I say, that's impossible. My husband, it's impossible that he would have picked her up. And then she looks at me, throws her hands kind of up in the air and went, well, then I guess she's lost. And so I looked back at her. I'm like, well, I guess I'm going to punch you in the face. (laughs) Just kidding. I didn't. I have a job to do here as your pastor. So I restrained myself, grabbed my son's hand, and walked across the street where my mother-in-law, thank God, Debbie was there. And I said, Debbie, I'm going to the school. They say she's lost. I don't know what's going on. I immediately start calling the school. All the way to the school, I'm calling. Nobody's picking up. Nobody's picking up. Nobody's picking up. Well, by the time I reached the school, I had, you know, what's that movie, Taken, where he's like, I will find you. I was in that mode, you know. I was like Wonder Woman. I was walking into that school, like ready to break some things. As I walk into the office, who do I see? But my daughter is sitting there on the chair in the office with fear in her eyes. But as she met mine, she immediately looked so just safe. And she she wrapped her arms around me, ran towards me, and we hugged. And we had a moment. And then as the moment came to a close, I stood up. And I looked at all of the teachers and the principal present. What? happened. They go on to tell me it was, it was a perfect storm. <laughs> oh, great. It's a perfect storm. Uh, we put on her hand earlier that day, her bus number, which was bus uh, number five, must have rubbed itself out during the day because we went and put her on bus uh, number eight. Turns out, Judah's freaking out at the end of the day on the bus. Where's my sister? I don't know where she is. She should be on this bus. They go to check bus number three, where they believe she was. There was an Abby on that bus. There was a dad who came and took that Abby off of the bus and brought her home. They go on back to Abby's actual bus and say, it's all good. Take Judah home. She's with her dad. Little did they know, Abby was doing a little tour of the neighborhood while crying the entire time all by herself. And so they look back and go, that's what happened. It was just the perfect storm. And honestly, I I do not believe that that came from the hand of God, but God sure did use it in my heart. And he spoke to me in that moment and said, you know what, that's my heart for my kids. That's how I feel every single day, knowing that my kids are lost, are confused, are wandering around the neighborhood looking for a home. And I'm that desperate father. I'm like, I, I have your heart, that mother heart that is like, move out of the way. I'm going to go and find my daughter. That's my heart for my kids. May we never forget, church, that why we do what we do. Why we gather here in this moment, even why I'm here in this room in the middle of a town on the outskirts of our city is so I can stand here and plead with you, church, to say, never forget, never lose your why. This is my why. This is why Caleb and I gather and build and pour our heart and soul offering that we just poured into this house. It's why we give of our time, of our talent, of our treasure. It's for the kids. It's for the generations. It's for legacy. It's so his kids can find themselves coming from the highways and the byways and come into a house of hope, come into a house of healing, come in from wherever it is that they were and come home so we can throw a party, so we can bring healing, so we can introduce them to Jesus, to salvation, to grace, to mercy, to his acceptance. It's for his kids. Do it for the kids. That day, that moment, I will never forget the emotion that gripped my heart. If I felt that just so I could feel the heart of God in a very real way, I'm grateful. It's why we do what we do. And you see this in the heart of David. You see his heart, don't you? 
I, I'm going to do this for, the, for my kid, for his kid, for Solomon. He had a generational heart. He had, he had this ability to not build, you know, a sandcastle palace, a sandcastle house where he would be the king of something that in one day, in one generation would be built and then it would end in nothing. No, he wanted to build the house of God, a house that would last the test of time. And did it not? We gather here today because of what was in the heart of David to see the house of God be built. And we're still building it here today in 2020. Even with all of the pushback and all the restrictions, nothing will stop the house of God in Jesus' name. Nothing can stop what God wants to build on the earth, and that is his church. I want to share with you this morning three choices that we need to make in on this day and in this season uh, that I believe will make preparations in your heart to see legacy, to see your life leave a legacy. Is that not the cry of your heart? Do we want to build lives that that just, you know, meet the needs of now and your today and satisfy the temporary? But is your heart moved towards eternity? In the word of God, it says that he's written eternity on our hearts. We have been created for eternity. We have been created to weigh everything against eternity. The word of God says, teach us to number our days so that we may gain a heart of wisdom. I never want to live just with the sight of of the temporary, but I want to live in light of eternity with what matters to the generations to come. So three things. Number one, choose. Your first choice you're going to make today is I'm going to choose empathy. I'm going to choose empathy. What is empathy? Empathy is the ability to understand and share the feelings of another, to understand, to understand and share the feelings of another. I remember Judah in the playground around five years old, he kept getting kicked in the sandbox over and over again by this kid and quite perplexed, but what's your problem? You know, he said to me at bedtime as he's telling me, he just kicked me over and over again, but then I thought, mom, back to earlier that day where that boy was putting his backpack on the hook while crying about his dog that had just died. And while I was being kicked in the sandbox, I remembered that moment and I understood why he was hurting me. He was just sad. And I was amazed. I honestly, I high-fived myself. I was like, good job parenting. (laughs) Just kidding. It's all him. He's amazing. But uh, he said, Mom, can we pray for him? I think he's actually sad at home right now. And I said, yes, we can. Right after you give me his full name, his address, and his mother's name. (laughs) Just kidding. (laughs) Uh, But honestly, I was amazed at his empathy. That was empathy in action. Judah, he just looked at the behavior of this kid and went, I see pain. I see pain. I see sadness. I pray, church, that we would never become so removed in us coming to know Jesus as our Lord and Savior, being scooped up and out of the pit, set up on a high rock. Is that not what God has done in your life? He took you out of the pit of despair. Let's never forget the pit of despair that we were once in when we didn't have Christ. That's so important. I feel this so deeply. Let's never forget what Christ has saved us from and what he has uh, set us up in. He took us out of the pit. He took us out of the miry clay and he set our feet on a rock. Let's never become so removed from the pit that we were once in. Because there are many, there are so many who are still living in that pit. That pit is their reality, living disconnected from their Savior, from the one who created them. 
We have the answer, don't we, my church? You have Jesus. You have the Holy Spirit living inside of you who has made himself at home in you. I pray that we would stay close, stay close to the pain, remain close to the needs of the people around us. More than ever, are we not well acquainted with a world who desperately needs a savior, with a world who is uh, inundated with fear, anxiety, and depression. And we have the answer as the church to rise up with empathy, with empathy. First, let's rise up with empathy. If you are far from the pain of the need, you will be far from the empathy required to meet it. Can I say that again? If you are far from the pain of the need, you'll be far from the empathy that's required to meet it. We have a savior, Jesus, who came and lived fully God and fully man. He came into our neighborhood. And I believe a big purpose of that is so he could say to us in our pain, in our rejection, in our disappointment, in our depression, he can look at us and say, me too. I felt that pain. I, I walked through betrayal. I walked through rejection. I walked through praise and I walked through their rejection. I felt it all. Hebrews 4.15 in the NIV, it says, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. But we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are. We do not have a high priest who's disconnected from the pain, but he empathizes. May we, my church, may we be the kind of church that shares in the heart of Christ that would say, yeah, yeah, I'm not so disconnected from what's going on in the lives of the people of our city, in my sphere of influence, in my family, in my friend group. But no, I am one that stays close to the needs of the people, to the pain of the people. Are we close to the lives of people, to the realities of what people are living through in this day? Let's stay close and remember what we have in being found, in being a part of a local church, this culture in here. What we have in here is not everybody's normal, but I pray uh, my prayer is that our empathy would move us into compassion so that the many people who have yet to find this place of belonging and home and salvation in Jesus would come into the house. May we move from empathy to compassion. Choose compassion, church. Choose empathy, but choose compassion. What is compassion? Let me tell you, compassion, the etymology of compassion is actually Latin, which means co-suffering, co-suffering. Compassion involves allowing ourselves to be moved by the suffering and experiencing the motivation, experiencing motivation to alleviate and to prevent it. Wow. All right. So where empathy brings understanding. I understand, I see you, tell me, tell me about it. What was it like? Tell me the pain, tell me the loss, tell me the rejection. And you sit there in the ash heap and you empathize and you hear. What compassion does is it takes you from understanding to helping people overstand. You help people then become overcomers. Compassion is, is not just an emotion of more uh, listening and leaning in. No, no, no. But compassion is like a, it's an active word. It motivates you to help to prevent and alleviate. You then become a person that's this like agent of change where you walk around and you see needs and you see pain and you go, oh gosh, I see it. I empathize and, and I have the answer to help you stand over the pain, to stand over the rejection 
compassion to stand over what has come upon you, happened to you, or even the things that people have chosen for themselves that have landed them in, in, the, in the heap that they're in. Compassion comes alongside and you help them stand over. Do you hear me, church? It means that you become somebody who doesn't leave people the way that you, f- you found them. You know, Jesus, he, he loves people as he found them, but he didn't leave them that way. Isn't that true? I even think of the story of uh, Peter and John at Cape Beautiful. They come up to a man who's begging, right, for money. And they look at him and with compassion, they look upon him and they say, silver and gold, I don't have what you're looking for in the natural, but I've got the power of a risen Christ who we saw die and rise again. And so were they not full of faith? And they said, rise up and walk. And this man who begged on those doorsteps of the temple for years, in a moment, because they had compassion on him, they met the need, not the natural one, but the one he really, really needed was to walk again. That ought to be our story, that as we come into contact with need, as we see the people of our communities, as we see people within our city, may we be the kind of people that co-suffer, see their pain and meet them in compassion. This is a really simple example, but I went to Montreal with one of our team members and my kids, and it was the middle of November like it is now, freezing cold. We dressed the kids well, but as you know, moms, it's like I forgot about myself, she forgot about herself. No mitts, no scarves, no hat. We were freezing walking through old Montreal. But together, we co-suffered in that moment. We were freezing cold. That co-suffering, the feeling of her pain and her feeling mine, it moved me with compassion. I saw gloves in a window. We walked in the store. I bought it for her. I bought it for myself. I met the need. I helped to alleviate her pain because I felt it with her. I pray, church that we again, that we wouldn't just look upon those who are in need, look upon those who don't yet know Christ and you know, from, from our window, look out and over, oh, isn't that just so sad? No, may we be the kind of church that doesn't stay distant from the needs of people. I know we've got to keep six feet or whatever is going on right now, distance between us and the people around us. But though we cannot be there in body for the people of our city, we can still carry, we can still meet needs, we can still come alongside, we can co-suffer with those who are facing off with stuff. I pray that this church, that my church, that we would step into days of compassion like never before, that we would see how we can come alongside and help alleviate, help people overstand in their situations and overcome in Jesus' name. Jesus never left anyone the same way as when he found them. Mark 6, 34, we're going to run through all kinds of scriptures, so get ready. Mark 6, 34 in the NIV, when Jesus went ashore, he saw a large crowd and he felt what? Compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd and he began to teach them. So his compassion, he saw them lost, he taught them, he moved into action. Matthew 14, 14, when he went ashore, he saw a large crowd and he felt compassion for them and he healed their sick. Compassion, healing, moved into action. Matthew 20, 34, I know I'm just helping you connect it, okay? We're connecting dots. He was moved with compassion. Jesus touched their eyes and immediately they regained their sight and followed him. Mark 1, 41, being deeply moved with tender compassion, Jesus reached out and he touched the skin of the leper. Wow. We understand this today. This, there, was, there was distance between uh, people and people with leprosy. They weren't even allowed in the community. Jesus reached out because of his compassion and touched 
the man with this leprosy and told him, of course, I want you to be healed. So now be cleansed. Mark 8, 2, I feel compassion for the people because they have remained with me now for three days and have nothing to eat. And we know the story of the loaves of the bread and the fish, and he goes on to feed thousands of people out of one little boy's lunch. You know what? Compassion. I hope you're hearing it this morning. Compassion takes empathy to a whole other level. It moves people out of their circumstance, out of the pain of their past, out of the rejection that they've encountered, out of their in poverty, out of their need, and into a greater place, into resolve, into belonging, into hope, into meeting the felt needs of the people. Compassion. Compassion is what God has called us to bring to our city, to our nation, and honestly, beyond in Jesus' name, like Buzz Lightyear always loves to say. Amen. To infinity and beyond. I had to do it. Compassion is action. What a powerful virtue to share with Jesus. Choose legacy, church. Choose legacy. Choose empathy. Choose compassion. And choose legacy. Live for the generation. Let's live lives that leave a legacy. Like David again, he had it in his heart to build the house, but he saw it was Solomon that was called to build. And so what did he do? He didn't kick his feet up and go, well, I'll just wait till it's time to pass the crown on to my son and then he can get to, to building from the ground up. No, no, no. David said, hey, it's Solomon. He's going to live in, in the abundance that I, I'm not going to see with my natural eyes. But while I am here for such a time as this, in my time and in my generation, I will make preparations. I'm going to set them up. I'm going to gather this stuff. I'm going to gather the bronze. I'm going to gather the gold. I'm going to gather the cedar. I'm going to gather all the stuff so I can say, here, son, stand on my shoulders. Is that the cry of your heart? Or are we living? Are we living to build a sandcastle for ourselves that in just with one wave, it's taken out? I pray that we would live this life in light of eternity, that we would live heaven spent, heaven spent, not wasting our energy on what is temporary, what will only last our dash from the time we're born to the time our time here on earth is done. I don't wanna live a life that lasts the dash, but I wanna live a life that enables the next generation to rise up and run through fields and fields of harvest because we recognized our season to sow. And we are in a season of great sowing, church. We are in a season where I believe the generations coming up after, my son, my daughters, your sons and daughters, their children's children, will look at this time in history and they'll say, thank you. Thank you for sowing. Thank you for not giving up. Thank you for pushing the boundaries. Thank you for remaining, for staying steadfast to building the house of God. My, my good friend, Steph, and I know you're in the chat and you know what story I'm gonna tell. She had a dream years ago in the early, early days of our church, in the real pioneering uh, grunt work of, of what it, it still is that, we're still pioneering, but gosh, young kids, babies, I was probably pregnant. And she looked at me and said, I had a dream about you last night and your son and his family, he was married with children, you and Caleb were in your 60s sitting on the front row of our venue. And he was up on the platform with his family thanking you. It was an honoring moment where they honored you for what you modeled to him and to his sisters as young children and throughout their lives of what it is to put priority on the house of God, to seek first the kingdom of God. He was honoring you for your labor, for keeping priority what is priority, for modeling to him what it was to build a house because he now was living in the fruit and the abundance and the harvest of what we sowed. 
in years past. And I remember listening to that and crying in the kitchen as she told me, as it was so comforting to know that what it is that we're building, I mean, you can never go, you'll never come last by putting God first. You'll never come last. You'll never be in need. You'll never be in lack if you build as Christ has called us to build in his word. He's given us great instruction, hasn't he? I mean, some of us can go, how do I build? How do I use my finances? How do I sow my life? What's the right order? Well, really simple. Matthew 6, says, but seek first his kingdom. Simple. Seek first above all else. Does that mean that I mean, I, I feel like this scripture is so practical because it acknowledges that there are seconds and thirds and fourths and fifths and 35s and 56s. You know, there are many things in our life that we are responsible for, that we need to pay for. Hello, am I speaking to anybody? There's Christmas gifts to buy. There's bills to be paid. There's food to be put on the table. There's clothes to buy. There's all kinds of needs. There's sports to pay for for your kids. There's tuitions to pay for. There's all kinds of seconds and thirds, but the Bible says to seek first, to put first his kingdom. And all of those things that come after will be taken care of. They'll be given to you as well. You know what? I believe that God uses funds not to, or he uses our finances not to raise funds, but to raise sons and daughters. As we choose to give our finances, as we choose to trust God with our treasure, which ultimately he entrusted to us as he's given us the gifts and the talents to produce wealth. But as we continue to put our trust into the hands of God by giving back our first fruits, what happens is we, we, we give up that striving position that we can take, can't we? I love the scripture where it says, uh, you know, the world of the stingy grows smaller and smaller, but the world of the generous grows larger and larger. Does that not challenge culture out here that would say, whoa, 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 hold on, hold on to all of it. Don't give any of it up. Uh, and, and you'll have more. Well, no, actually, the world of the generous, the, the one who is, is like an open, it comes in and it goes out. It comes in and it goes out. That is how God has called us to live. And it is for legacy. It is for the generations. It is so that the ones that come after us, our children's children, will have a place to call home. Don't you love this scripture, Proverbs 13, 22. It says, a good man, a good man or woman leaves an inheritance to his children's children. And the wealth of the sinner is stored up for the hands of the righteous. A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. I love what Pastor John Burns always says is you don't know a good man until you see his children's children. There's a principle in that and it's this scripture. I pray that we would live lives that leave a legacy, that we would see beyond the here and the now and the right now and the demands of our day. But church, will we be a people as we continue to be generous? I know we've been so generous. What a generous offering, our heart and soul. We are positioned like never before to be to be a blessing of empathy and compassion to the world around us. But never, uh, like never before, I have felt in my spirit that we are contending in this season for legacy, for the generations, for those who are coming after. We are going to build a home, a house of hope, a house of healing, a house of blessing, a house where many will come in from all walks of life and say, thank you for sowing. Thank you for living, not for the here and for the now, but for sacrificing for me, for my family, and for my children's children. How beautiful it is to sow into the house of God, time, talent, and treasure. 
I pray that you will continue to stay on the front foot of the battle line that is building this house. Yes, you. You are a part of God's army on the earth, his rescue plan for humanity, and you making space and room in your life creates a legacy for the people coming after you. I love you, church. Caleb and I are so grateful for you. We're grateful for your continued sacrifice. I pray that we'll continue to give in, in ways that, oh, like never before. So let's pray together. Let's, let's uh, close this up like a little bow. Whoop, and uh, pray blessing over you and your family. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you for every single person gathered here today. Thank you for our church. Thank you for my church, for the people that call my church home. Thank you for the sons and the daughters. Thank you for from the very young and all the way up. God, thank you for the mothers and the fathers. Thank you for the sacrifice of this house to see your church, to see your house, your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. There are so many beautiful, generous people that call our church home. I pray a blessing over their family that as they continue to prioritize your house, as they continue to give towards it, to see it like the heart of David be exceedingly magnificent, famous in the earth. God, thank you that their family will be blessed, that there will be a blessing on their legacy as they put in proper order, building your kingdom first and all of everything else will be added. I pray that that would be the testimony of our people, that we will be a people who put God first, who trust your word and not just trust it, but we lean on it. We act on it. We prioritize your kingdom, God. May your kingdom come on this earth and may we be a people who build your house and your kingdom on the earth. Thank you for the entrustment. It is such an entrustment. It is such a privilege. It is such an honor that you would continue to partner with us to build your house on the earth. We love you, God. And we're so, so humbled and grateful with the opportunity. Would you refine our why? Would you remind us in this moment what this is all about? It's all about your kids. It's all about your children. It's about the lost ones. Jesus came, you came saying, I've come to seek and to save that which is lost. May that be why we do what we do. The bottom line, it's all about those who still need to find home, hope, belonging, and salvation, and healing in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. I love you, church. Have an incredible Sunday. We'll see you next week at, or yeah, next week at midweek. I love you. Mwah.